Uh, hello, my name is Philip Cohen. I believe you're looking at my shared screen now. Uh, welcome to our session, which is called Science to Policy. What do we know about the science that becomes law? Um, I'm Philip Cohen from the University of Maryland Department of Sociology. I will be moderating um, the panel today, which is basically just staying out of the way and letting the panelists present as much as possible and then facilitating questions and comments at the end. Uh, uh, I think I will give a brief introduction of the speakers now at the beginning and uh, allow you to, uh, and then we'll just go from one to the other once we get started. So uh, we'll be starting with uh, Rob Burt, Rob McCown, um, McCoon, sorry, um, um, a social uh, psychologist and public policy analyst uh, who is a professor, the James and Patricia Cowell Professor of Law at Stanford Law School. Uh, his work is concerns drug policy, perceptions of fairness in the justice system, social influence and bias, the use of scientific evidence and many other topics. Um, so uh, Rob will get us started. Uh, number two, number two will be uh, Catherine Zeiler. Um, Kathy is the Nancy Barton Scholar and Professor of Law at Boston University School of Law where she applies economic theory and empirical methods to the study of legal issues and research questions, um, uh, an advocate of empirical legal studies. Um, and she studies among other things, the use of experimental and behavioral economics in legal scholarship and issues uh, around uh, medical malpractice insurance. Our third guest um, is the uh, president of the Social Science Research Council, Anna Harvey who is also professor of politics at NYU, where she is the director of the Public Safety Lab and co-director of the Criminal Justice Expert Panel. Um, so delighted to have uh, Professor Harvey here. And uh, our last presenter will be Sean Grant. Uh, Sean is assistant professor of social and behavioral sciences at the Indiana University School of Public Health. Um, his work uh, advances evidence-based practice and uses the tools of meta-science. Um, he's especially focused on where improvements can be made in the areas of open science, research, research synthesis methods, and stakeholder engagement. So we're gonna have a lively uh, panel. Um, uh, I'm going to, like I said, stay out of the way. Uh, I'll keep a quick clock. I'm gonna keep a little clock running, but I think each of our panelists is gonna stay to 15 minutes. Um, and then um, if you have questions, you can put them in the uh, chat or Q&A, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll have a, a round of questions and interaction at the end. So with no further ado, I will turn it over to our first speaker, Rob McCown. Cool. Okay, hello, everyone. Um, the, uh, do, uh, should I be sharing my own slides uh, or? Yes, please. Yeah. Shut okay. Up, sharing mine. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna put my slides up on the screen now, and uh, um, so I'm gonna be talking about fact finding and law and comparing it with science, but also with um, empirical research on 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 the law. And uh, I'll just start out with what's probably a silly question, but just to sort of frame things, you know. Are the laws of physics in any way comparable to the laws of the state of California? We use the same word law. Clearly, clearly these are two very different notions of, um, of what law might mean. Although both the rule of law and the rule of facts are important forms of social ordering. So I wanna talk about the intersections of these. Um, you're all familiar with Venn diagrams. I've got one here with uh, scientific evidence and law and social science and law. Uh, I should say it's not drawn to scale. Obviously, social science and law is not as large as scientific evidence or, um, or law. I'm also, I'm also not making a dig at social science and law when I leave some of it outside the circle of scientific evidence. All, all I really mean by that is there's a lot of work in, in social science and law or in empirical legal studies that is qualitative. And today, I'm mostly going to be focusing on uh, statistical um, science. Um, and so I won't talk about qualitative research. Oops. Uh, so, so I want to just um, compare and contrast some, some features that I think are important in, in comparing science and law. Um, and, and, and there are some important parallels between the two, but also some uh, very important differences. So I'll start out, the first two rows really refer to um, 
you know, two different branches of epistemology, two different theories of truth. Truth is coherence and truth is correspondence. Um, and they're not really competing theories. I think both of these play a role in both science and law. So in science, um, truth is coherence involves um, proper use of deductive logic. Um, in some sciences, mathematical proofs to, to derive uh, um, theorems. And of course, uh, coherence in terms of um, probability norms, statistical norms, especially sort of the Bayesian um, framework for thinking coherently about um, updating probabilities under uncertainty. Now the law also uh, relies on truth as coherence. Uh, so a lot of particularly uh, lawmaking by judges involves um, judgments of coherence of, uh, of a fact pattern with written laws, um, with precedents. But increasingly, the law does um, take seriously notions of probability and statistical theory. And in fact, there's quite a uh, lively literature on Bayesian interpretations of legal fact finding and whether laws are coherent as representations of uh, proper Bayesian updating. Now, truth is co correspondence is more the empirical side. And of course, that's a big part of what we do in science is trying to establish the reliability and the validity of our empirical evidence and uh, um, both descript descriptively and our causal inferences. Uh, but truth is correspondence is also, um, you know, empirical evidence is a very important part of, of litigation, um, in fact, and negotiation. And um, uh, as represented by, you know, a large army of, of experts who testify in cases, but increasingly our law students uh, at, at Stanford, and I, I'm guessing at Boston and, and other places are, are taking classes on empirical legal studies, um, statistics and the law and so on. So again, there, there, you know, there are some parallels there. Now, where we really get to the uh, big differences, um, the, um, the methodology of truth seeking, there, there, there are two different theories of how to get at the truth uh, that are very much intention. And here I'm talking about aspirations, not necessarily the reality, but the aspiration of the scientific approach is, uh, what lawyers would call inquisitorial. Um, uh, in inquisitorial legal systems are systems in which um, a, some neutral arbiter, uh, like a judge, actually collects all the evidence, um, weighs all the evidence, um, and gives enormous power to this third party decision maker who is supposed to be acting in a neutral way. Um, and so um, that's the way most of us are trained that scientists are supposed to behave uh, as neutral fact finders. And as this whole conference, I'm sure, is illustrating in myriad ways, there, uh, science does not always live up to that. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Now, the, uh, the, the American legal system is at the extreme end of a continuum from inquisitorial to adversarial. And, um, and what that means is that lawyers are supposed to be tenacious advocates um, for their, the side they're representing, for their client. Their proper role is to be biased. Um, now, there's some important um, boundaries on that. They're not supposed to misrepresent evidence. They're not supposed to fudge data. Um, but they are expected um, to, they aren't expected to be balanced. Um, if, if opposing counsel fails to bring up some important fact, uh, so much the worse for opposing counsel. And, um, but of course, we all know scientists often behave in an adversarial way. Um, now, there's a, a, a well-known theory in, um, uh, in the law put forth in 1978 by John Thiebaud and Lawrence Walker, in which they argue that the proper domain of science is conflicts of truth and the proper domain of law is conflicts of interest. And so their suggestion is adversarial system is a good system for dealing with conflicts of interest. Science is a better system for dealing with truth conflicts. I think that's probably a little too glib. Every, every piece of litigation involves both truth conflicts and conflicts of interest. And, and increasingly, if anyone you know, is working on a, a scientific project that has any political implications at all, 
there are going to be conflicts of interest involved there. So this is, again, these, these are um, sort of platonic types, and the reality is much more blurred. Um, now, some years ago, uh, I offered reasons why adversarialism might work better in the law than in science. And so I just want to quickly go over that. And the most important uh, row of this table is the explicit adversary role. So when a lawyer behaves as an advocate, everyone knows they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. No one thinks they're supposed to, no one, only the most naive person would think that lawyers are being completely unbiased and disinterested. Um, also in, in most legal disputes, well, just about at any legal dispute, there are at least two sides represented. Um, there is an explicit standard of proof in legal cases. There are several different standards that are used. Um, it's, an, it's a different question as to whether people actually comply with that, jurors and judges. Um, there's an explicit third party decision maker who needs to pr produce closure. They need to reach a decision. And in most cases in the law, one of the two sides is right, or there's some grain of truth to both sides, but usually the truth is somewhere within the domain of the dispute. Now, if you contrast science, science is quite different on these dimensions. First of all, when you represent yourself as a scientist, you are saying, don't look at me as an advocate. Don't look at me as an adversary. Um, trust me, I'm a scientist. Um, scientific disputes, it's not always the case that there are at least two sides represented. Sometimes everyone in the research community is on board with a single pet hypothesis. Um, we have explicit standards of proof for um, statistical significance, but that's a very narrow part of science. And there are all sorts of scientific judgments that are made without a clear, uh, explicit standard of proof. And we can get away with that because there is no explicit third party decision maker in most cases who has to once and for all decide, you know, is string theory uh, the, the, our proper theory or are we going to go with some other theory? Um, you know, the, it's an ongoing conversation that spans, spans decades um, it, until a policy decision has to be made. And that's something I'll come back to. And then finally, we know from the history of science that scientific disputes often fail to bound the truth. There's, it's often the case that none of the parties are correct. They're all wrong. Um, okay. So now science plays a big role in, um, in the law, but it's, uh, it's mostly mediated through experts. I don't need to say a lot about this because I, you know, I think you all know a lot about this. If you watch TV, you've seen countless examples of this, but um, you know, in the adversarial system, there's a marketplace for experts. Um, we know uh, a lot of my own research specifically manipulates expert confidence um, holding um, testimony constant and jurors rely very heavily on expert confidence to judge the validity of the science. Now, the problem is the market for experts um, often rewards bias. Um, uh, so of course the lawyer is biased, but they often are looking for an expert who's also biased. And the market, even for unbiased experts, rewards overconfidence. And I can speak from um, personal experience of the pressures I've been under from lawyers to um, to not hedge, to, to, to be more categorical in my statements. Okay, and you know, one of the problems we have is, the, uh, is frankly an enormous arrogance of, of PhDs in the law. And we got away with that for a long time, but those days are over and there's a great deal more cynicism. So we really have to pay attention to um, what makes us credible and earning the trust of the people we want to um, influence with our research. Now, I, I want to say a couple things about specifically about social science and law. So um, I have a longstanding interest in bias and in the interpretation of, of research results as a 1998 annual review piece. Um, the literature on that topic has just exploded um, uh, in, in the past decade or so. And as you all know, there are a variety of problems that lead people to um, abuse or misuse statistical evidence. And, and there's, on the basis of these concerns, there's really been an exciting progress in trying to up our game and try to minimize these problems. And you know, we had traditional practices, methodology, peer review replication, um, uh, 
occasional replication. But the open science movement has really brought a whole new toolbox of you know, pre-registration of hypotheses, sharing of data, um, many labs replication, um, uh, blinded data analysis. And um, I just wanna mention how uh, difficult it is to implement some of these in empirical legal studies for a number of reasons. First, the data are quite often confidential and we, we're not allowed to post them or share them. Um, and so that's a big obstacle. Direct replication is often infeasible because so researchers are often studying a, a historically situated event that happened one time, like what is the effect of a particular change in law, which happened at a particular time, and you can't go out and replicate that change in law again. Um, the, even when that's not the case, field work is a, considerably more expensive than laboratory research in the social sciences. That's probably not true in the natural sciences, but the social sciences, that's true. Um, and uh, requires getting a lot of stakeholder permissions lined up to do the research. It can be very difficult to pre-register uh, your hypotheses because you often don't know what your measurement variables will be until you really are given access to case files and you start finding out what is measurable. Um, and, um, and then finally, you know, trying to achieve um, uh, statistical significance with uh, a rigorous alpha level is, is daunting because our, our statistical power is often capped by the available units of study. There may only be 29 judges in a jurisdiction uh, to study. Uh, so those are all challenges that we face. Um, some of these challenges can be addressed by blinded data analysis. And this, I, this is just an advertisement for an article I published in Nature with uh, Saul Permutter, who is a physicist, um, describing the some of the techniques that physicists use to reduce bias, um, which by the way, has nothing to do with physics. It's just that they happen to stumble on these ideas first. And it mostly involves perturbing the data with uh, some combination of noise and bias so that when you're analyzing the data, you can't be influenced by it. And this is something I think that could be done with expert witnesses. They could be given blinded data sets, apply their preferred method, and then don't lift the blind until after they've already submitted um, uh, their, you know, their code and, uh, and lift the blind. Now, the final thing I want to talk about is um, an emerging issue at the intersection of open science and the law. And that's um, uh, uh, what might be called the weaponization of open science. So, so quick quiz, who have been the biggest champions of, of open science in the federal government in the past decade? Um, Scott Pruitt. Uh, the uh, Trump's administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency, and Paul Ryan, the, the former Speaker of the House, both seized upon open science methods to uh, try to influence regulatory policy by, by raising the standards for, for um, not, for example, not allowing EPA to use data unless uh, the, the data were uh, procured through open science methods and shared and so on. Um, the, uh, just, there are a couple of examples, the, the Foundation for Evidence-Based Policy Act. I think most of us, if we read this act, um, just on its own terms, we would say, oh, these, this is all leading to better quality science, that the call for greater uh, openness uh, is something we should foster. Um, the Strengthening Transparency and Regulatory Science uh, uh, rule is, is another attempt to bring open science to bear on the EPA's work. Now, the last thing I, I do not want to maintain that if a conservative endorses open science, that's suspect. That's not what I'm arguing. Rather, I, I just want to suggest, and I'm about to close here, but I just want to suggest that when we, um, that we can scrutinize political calls for open science, that there's some criteria we can use to see um, how, how seriously to take these claims. And you know, one of the issues is, is this being argued in good faith? Um, and I would suggest that it's, a, it's in good faith if the speaker, if the advocate of open science recognizes that there is a trade-off between rigor and responsiveness. Um, policy decisions have to be made. Uh, you know, if we had waited for the best vaccine evidence, we would not be, um, none of us would have had the vaccine uh, by now. Um, and a corollary of that is trading off the cost of wrong action with the cost of inaction. Um, 
And another thing that makes can make a call for open science bad faith if it's mostly just applied to findings we don't like. Um, and you know, so one of the things I would ask about um, uh, these recent efforts uh, in the Trump administration and by, by Paul Ryan is um, why they focused on EPA regulation but not, did not propose open science for criminal justice data, for military data, for economic research. Um, all of which could arguably benefit just as much from open science. And for these reasons, uh, I'm going to su suggest that I believe that these, these calls for open science were not in good faith. But that's not to say the government should not move toward open science. It's just we need to do so in a transparent and fair way. So I'll stop at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Okay, we'll turn it over to Kathy Seiler. All right, let me share my screen. So I think, um, I hope you can now see my screen. Yes? Yep. yep. Okay. So um, uh, first, thank you to Jason Chin for inviting me to participate and to Philip also for moderating. Thank you so much. And it's an honor to be among the distinguished panelists today. Um, I'm I'm relatively new to the field of meta science, and I'm at the same time horrified and optimistic. Um, so I think I'm probably not alone. I hope I'm not alone in either of those sentiments at this point. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about what might be considered a case study um, for this for this panel. Um, and so I I uh, latched on to this piece of the panel description to be the focus of my talk. So um, I'm gonna walk through what might, what again might be considered a case study um, related to how research can be selected and summarized. Um, I, don't, I don't have anything much to say about how we might present it to policymakers, but I will say a word at the end about how research um, is used by policymakers um, and uh, the, the um, the news is not good news. So just to give you a heads up. So I'll start in uh, with this book chapter in 2013, I published with Lorianne Hardcastle, a literature review of the quantitative empirical studies that aim to estimate the effects of tort reform on medical malpractice insurance prices, something I've been obsessed with for over a, over a decade. And in particular, we tried to draw inferences from 16 studies that we located that purport to estimate the effect of state statutory damages caps on, um, so the limitations on how much an injured patient can recover in a tort suit against a doctor, um, how these caps affect medical malpractice insurance premiums, including some, some that I had produced um, as part of my own PhD uh, dissertation. So one of the studies is actually my own. So I don't, I don't feel so bad bashing all of the studies because one, one belongs to me as an author. So at this uh, point, roughly half of all US states cap the amount that patients can recover in medical malpractice claims against healthcare providers. And the caps generally focus on punitive damages, and non-economic damages that compensate for pain and suffering as opposed to economic harm. And researchers, including myself, have capitalized on the variation in damages caps across states, as well as variation over time to develop identification strategies. So I'll argue it's an, it's an important um, policy question. The obvious question to begin with is, whether tort reforms meet their intended goal of reducing or stabilizing um, insurance premiums. This has potential implications on physician supply uh, and the cost of healthcare. Um, although as a side note, given that so few injured patients sue, medical malpractice insurance is a tiny fraction of the total cost of healthcare. So deterrence um, theory suggests that the effect of damages caps on premiums is ambiguous. Um, so while caps might reduce the average per claim payout, the reduced pressure on providers might encourage providers, uh, those on the margin, 
to reduce effort enough to actually increase the number of lawsuits. And so if the increase in the number of suits swamps the reduction in per, in per claim payouts, then we might expect malpractice prices to increase. They reflect a higher overall payout from the tort system. We might also um, be interested in research questions related to trade-offs. So for example, for a particular set of injured patients, um, especially those who endure great physical pain, but who suffer little in the way of economic losses because they don't incur additional medical expenses and they can't claim lost wages, for example, because they don't work. Caps on non-economic and punitive damages might make it impossible to find attorneys willing to pursue these claims. It's quite expensive. Um, Rob mentioned expert testimony. Um, and in medical malpractice cases, those experts are quite expensive to employ um, and to get to work on the case. And so, um, so the, the theory actually uh, is not, uh, does not just go in one direction. So the predictions are ambiguous and it's important to look at data to try to figure out what might be going on. Um, and so we have these 16 studies, at least as of 2013. So this is a bit dated, but my guess is not, nothing much has changed. Um, I could be wrong about that, but I would be surprised. So we started um, our, our review by summarizing the estimates by statistical significance, which I now regret. So um, if you look at this table, you'll see the studies, the list of 16 studies, and, and I'm in there somewhere in the middle, and uh, the publication types. So about you know, more, than, more than half of these studies were published in peer-reviewed journals. Um, there are a couple book chapters. Um, there are some published by the Brookings Institute, uh, which is a think tank. Um, my, my studies are in a dissertation. And then uh, at this time, at least one study was unpublished. And you can see from the uh, covered periods that the studies cover a variety of different periods. There's no standard period covered. Um, and that for both premiums and for um, years that tort reforms were passed. So there's a lot of variation in the, um, in the uh, data that these researchers are using to try to estimate the effects of caps on, on prices of insurance. Um, you can see that each study doesn't produce just one estimate. In fact, um, there are several studies that produce um, several dozen estimates using different models and different, uh, different controls, et cetera. And so across these 16 studies, we actually get 197 estimates of the impact of damages caps on premiums. And so we did a fine grain um, look at estimates, variation over estimates, and you can see from the table here that um, when researchers measure the impact on premiums, both by premiums paid per doctor and aggregate premiums, we see a pretty wide variety in the types of results um, that researchers are getting. So the literature is mixed. We'd look at this and we'd say the literature is mixed. So um, our goal was to try to figure out what inferences we could draw from the pile of studies. Um, and so I, I, we started by trying to uncover explanations for these mixed results. What explains the mixed results? And obviously it's going to be different time periods, different data sources were used. Um, not, all, not all researchers are using the same data sources to identify damages caps. Not all researchers are using the same data sources to gather premiums. They also, of course, use different identification methods. So these are not, these are non-experimental studies. They're observational studies, which offer a different type of challenge um, when it comes to replication and so on. And so for these reasons and others, um, our, uh, what, we, what we hope to do, which was a formal meta-analysis, was of course impossible. We could not try, given the nature of the studies and the, this variability, to try to use these, these studies to produce one estimate. It was impossible. So our, our approach in the face of this um, data and methods variation was to try to identify 
which studies deserve the most weight when it comes to drawing inferences from them. So that's, that's what we resorted to. So for example, which employed the best identification strategies and used the best data sources? And I'll explain our approach um, in the face of, of that difficulty. And I'll also say some closing words about the use of um, the research by policymakers. So the conclusion was pretty grim. Um, and again, I'll remind, I'll remind the audience that one of my studies is in the pile. Um, we, we ended up concluding that in fact, none of the studies deserves any weight at all. Um, and for a number of reasons. So just to provide some examples of the reasons why uh, we, were, we were reluctant to place any weight on um, the inferences that might be uh, gleaned from these studies. First, um, generalizability of the results is very limited due to the nature of the premiums data that were employed by the researchers. So the premiums data, of course, um, is very difficult to get. It's, it's very hard to collect these data. I know because I've spent the last decade trying to co co collect a random sample from the entire population of prices from state departments of insurance who regulate prices of insurance and have data on insurance. But most of the researchers, um, if not all of the researchers, used um, data that is, is not a random sample from the entire population. So for example, one, one very popular data set is to use a voluntary survey of insurance companies who can report or not report, they can choose. And so we, of course, we might wonder whether the insurance companies who are willing to report to this data set actually are, are um, like the ones who don't, are not reporting, choosing not to report. In addition to that, the premiums data are limited in a lot of cases to policies with particular coverage limits. So for example, we might expect that damages caps of say $250,000 on non-economic damages would affect prices of policies with per occurrence limits of $100,000, very skimpy policies, differently than those with limits of $1 million per occurrence. And so many studies used um, uh, policies of, of one particular type. So we have, we have um, reason to believe that policies will affect the prices of different policies with, with differing generosity differently. And also that doctors after caps are passed might move from one policy type to another. And that this sorting of doctors among different policy types um, might in fact impact prices as well. And these studies are not going to pick that up. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, damages caps, uh, of course, are not randomly assigned, right? So we're not, we're, we, we're not conducting an experiment here. And so we need, um, through these observational studies, to control for selection. That's absolutely crucial. Um, but we found that it's the controls were not well implemented in any one of the studies, so um, in, including my own. So one example here is that many of the studies use a technique called difference and differences models, um, and that approach assumes parallel pretreatment trends. And I'm not going to go into the details. The most important part here is that not one study discussed or checked or reported on whether um, the, the pretreatment trends were parallel. And we know from studies of premiums outside this literature, um, one actually done by Dan Ho at Stanford Law, that um, this, this actually is a material issue. So we know from other studies that the, pre the, the pretreatment trends are probably not parallel, which, which is a cause for concern. Finally, um, there are a number of other theoretical assumptions of the models that were not verified or adequately addressed. Um, basic assumptions um, for, for studies that, for example, just use ordinary least square as very basic models. Um, you know, uh, there was no check of um, whether the error terms are normally distributed. In panel data studies, the authors did not verify the absence of serial correlation. Um, uh, of the error terms and other very basic assumptions. 
And so, so currently I'm working with a co-author, Mike Frakes, who's at Duke Law, and we're gonna, we're hoping to conduct the 17th study using better data and better methods. Um, and so, and to add to uh, the, the, the knowledge that we have, um, which we, of course, we don't, we don't think is very good at this point. So one question remains, um, one, there's one open question at this point, which is, what the quality of these studies matter. So we, we might not care much about this messy literature if policymakers are not using it. So last week I assigned to my research assistant to go out and try to figure out whether any of these studies had been cited um, in any government documents. And uh, we found that just in a very, so there's nothing systematic about the search that we did. So it was just a very basic search. And we found that at least half of the studies had been cited in legal documents. So just to give you a flavor for where these studies show up in law, um, court cite to them. So the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in, in a medical malpractice case cited to one of the studies. The Wisconsin Supreme Court cited um, in a decision about whether statutory damages caps violate the Equal Protection Clause of the Alaska court um, decided on a similar issue and cited to one of the studies. Um, so just re uh, reflecting back to Rob's talk, um, it seems like the adversarial system, at least under this case study, is imperfectly effective at weeding out um, the uh, weak, weak science. Um, and legislatures are also citing to these studies. So for example, in, across several years, as, the, as, the, um, con as Congress was trying to push a federal tort reform bill, um, we see congressional records citing to these, these studies that we looked at here. So the House of Representatives is doing this, the Senate in their um, records is citing to the, the work. Um, Washington State is citing in its legislative history of its tort reform act. And the Congressional Budget Office that scores legislation that tells us how, how expensive legislation is gonna be or what are going to be the effects of legislation cites to um, cites to these some, some of these studies in their report on effects of state tort reform. And we also found a letter, a 2000 uh, letter from a New York State Trial Lawyers Association to the New York governor at the time urging the signing of the statute elim eliminating some tort reform. So, um, so the, uh, these sites are also, these studies are also cited in, in um, lobbying efforts to uh, get government actors to do to do one thing or another. So I'll end there and I look forward to the other presentations and to the to the questions. Thanks so much. Ah, thank you very much, um, Kathy, and uh, for sticking to your time. Appreciated. Um, <clears throat> uh, we uh, uh, let me just remind uh, our audience uh, that you can put questions in the Q and A, and um, I will lob them in the appropriate direction when we get to that uh, portion of the program. Uh, and so without further ado, Anna Harvey. Great, well, thank you, Philip. And you know, thanks to, to Philip and to Jason and to the conference for inviting me. It's great to be here. So this is, Kathy, that was, it's a great segue into what I wanted to talk about. You're the last part of your talk, namely about um, how do policymakers respond to evidence? So, you know, one way to think about this question of, of what, what science gets adopted into law is to think about it as a research question and, and, and to think and to ask, can we use the tools of rigorous science to study how and whether policymakers respond to rigorous science? Um, and so that means using policymakers as subjects in experimental designs, which is hard to do. And Rob talked about some of the challenges. Um, but within the last few years, we've seen a few really nicely done studies emerge. And I thought it might be useful for me just to talk about those. Um, this isn't work that I've done, but it's work that I've been drawing upon um, at the Social Science Research Council as we think about how can we, um, how can we best <clears throat> encourage policymakers to adopt <laughs> the findings of, of rigorous research. Um, so the first study that I want to talk about, um, and I'm just going to talk, I, I, I didn't make slides for this, is a, is a couple of survey experiments that um, a team of World Bank economists did on um, policymakers, governmental employees, who were invited to impact evaluation workshops being hosted by the bank. And so they did a couple experiments on, on um, invitees before they attended the, the evaluation workshop. There's also some post workshop results, but just the pre-workshop results. 
Um, the, the first experiment they did, they, they, um, they, it, was a, it was a choice experiment. So they gave the invitees um, descriptions of two programs. And they said, all right, so imagine that you have to recommend one of, you have to recommend one of these two programs to some counterpart agency in your country. Um, and you have information from a study that was done about each program, which we summarized below. And they varied the attributes of the studies that were done. So one attribute they varied was the method. And this, this gets to one of Kathy's points. So they were either just purely correlational observational studies um, quasi-experimental and then full RCT experimental studies. Um, they varied the location of the study. Is it in the same, is it in your country, same country, same region, a different country or a different region altogether? Um, they varied the size of the estimated impact. So both studies are programs that were attempting to, to move the same outcome and call it, you know, enrollment rates, you know, kids, kids school enrollment rates. Um, and they vary the size of the estimated impact. And then finally, they vary the margin of error for a 95% confidence interval, which, you know, would, would tell you <laughs> if that, you know, given, given the size of the impact and, and, the, and the margin of error would tell you if, if, if it was significant. They also offered one final piece of information, which is that, quote unquote, a local expert tells you that they believe program A or program B, which they varied, would perform better in your context. And then they asked, they asked the policymakers, okay, which program would you recommend? Um, and the kind of, you know, Kathy's, this is, you know, um, consistent with Kathy's grim finding, which is that policymakers were completely unresponsive to um, design. So whether it was correlational or quasi-experimental or RCT had no impact on their recommendations. They were also um, unresponsive to precision um, or, or significance or the size of the confidence interval. Um, and there's, there's the, 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 the results on location were, um, were kind of in between. It looked like they were more likely to, to recommend programs in their own country, but what really popped out were bigger estimated treatment effects, irregardless of the design of the study or the precision of the estimation, just big treatment effects that right, the point estimate um, and whether programs were recommended, quote unquote, recommended by a local expert and the magnitudes of these effects were pretty large. They also ran the same experiment on the social science prediction platform with researchers to see what a, a, a community of researchers would, um, how they would respond to the same experiment. And not surprisingly, right, because they're running it on people like us um, in, 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 the, in the experiment on researchers, method um, and tight confidence intervals were, were highly important in addition to size of impact, but location and, and local um, recommendation were not important. Um, and, and method goes in the direction you would think, so anything that was not <laughs> correlational. Um, so so this, this is you know, part of our concern about here we are doing all this rigorous science, but maybe it has no relationship to um, maybe our, you know, the, the rigor of the science has no relationship to policy choices. Um, they also did a second experiment about, um, about searching for information in which now they're, they're holding constant, um, there's a program and they're asking policymakers um, essentially uh, if, which, which of the two studies would you rather see? And they vary the attributes of the studies in order to make a decision about the likely impact of a program. And again, they're varying the, the same attributes. Here, um, there was a little bit more evidence that experimental and quasi-experimental um, that, that policymakers would rather see that, you know, if they have to see something, they'd rather see that than, than observational um, and some evidence that, that sample size matters. But, but here, um, estimated, uh, estimated effect still popped out as very important for policymakers suggesting that um, when they're searching for information, there's going to be a bias among policy uh, policymakers to to want to see studies with large estimated treatment effects, which might, you know, which is going to which is going to skew the the their estimates of of the effect they think that a study might have, right? Conditional on you know thinking about a, a single program and, and, and looking for studies about it. Um, and just one other one other study in this vein, which is a recent one, Daniel Chen and, and Sultan Mahmood did, I just came out um, a little bit ago on using um, deputy ministers in Pakistan 
um, where I want to talk about there was an intervention, but 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 outside of the intervention, they ran um, a choice experiment on the on the ministers where they elicited ministers' beliefs about the impact of a deworming program on the long run um, earnings potential of of kids who were who would participate in, in the deworming program, and and they got a baseline estimate of about a five percent increase in 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 earnings estimates. Um, and they also asked the ministers if they would if they would rather implement a deworming plan or build computer labs for kids. Um, and about 40 percent, if I'm remembering this right, 40 percent of the sample said they'd rather um, uh, pick the deworming program. And about 60 percent said build computer labs for kids. Then they give <clears throat> an experiment. They gave the policymakers a signal, a summary of um, a Michael Kramer paper on uh, an RCT on the long run impacts of deworming. Um, and and they uh, the results of which um, suggested a, a much larger increase in earnings long run, 13% increase in long run earnings. They gave them the figure um, and they said there's a recent randomized evaluation and here's what they found. And then they um, they uh, tried to see if policy, if the if the ministers in the experiment updated and um, and kind of similar to the to the World Bank experiments, there was um, no updating on the estimated effect, right? So even though they'd just been told that there was a recent randomized, you know, experiment, and here's what it found, there wasn't there wasn't any movement to increase their estimate of the um, effect, and there was no movement in their choice of program. So there was just, there was it was like just completely unresponsive to the to the per, to the provision of the evidence in the survey experiment. Okay, so that's the bad news, right? That's the kind of that's the the dismal grim news. But then there's the question of well, has, has anybody found any interventions that um, seem to increase um, trust in and uptake of of rigorous science? And so actually all the all these experiments and one more that I haven't talked about did did use an intervention that seemed to increase uptake and i'll just kind of go over them quickly. Um, in the World Bank um, in the World Bank uh, uh, experiment using um, policymakers who were invited to impact evaluation workshops, they also did post workshop evaluations. Um, where they uh, ran the same uh, choice experiment, but post workshop, and it was these were week long workshops conducted by academics and you know World Bank staff on um, basically the, the the basics of of, of, in, of rigorous impact evaluation. So they did find um, uh, that in the in the pre, although although in the pre workshop um, survey experiment there wasn't any weight. Um, placed on a study having um, deployed an RCT design. Um, this, this, there, there was now a weight in the post-workshop um, post survey experiment. So now that did increase um, recommendations, right? Knowing that, that there was evidence that came from an RCT. In the um, in the Pakistan experiment, um, this is I, <laughs> this one I really love um, because they, they they use the book that I use in, in one of my undergraduate classes. Um, so um, they uh, they gave the ministers a choice um, between having a high or a low probability of getting sent um, either mastering metrics um, by Anne Kristen Fischke, which is the one I use in my undergraduate classes, or a book called Mindsight, which is a self-help book, um, which focuses on kind of positive psychology. And so they chose this higher low probability that the ministers did of kind of, you know, of, of receiving, you know, either of these options. And then it was randomized within that, um, which book they got. And then they had to watch, they got the book and they had to watch a series of videos by either Anchrist or um, the author of Mindsight. And then they engaged in a series of like writing exercises. And okay, so there was like a, a six week long kind of instruction program in essentially either in, you know, kind of causal inference in the basics, basic econometrics or um, positive psychology. Um, and then they they did a bunch of, um, they did a bunch of, you know, evaluations of the impact of, of the treatment. And they found really large effects here. So this is the this is the same group of ministers, which um, in the deworming experiment that I just talked about, 
um, that's the control group that was unresponsive. The, the, so in other words, the group that had received the positive psychology book and training was unresponsive to being presented with RCT evidence about the long run, you know, beneficial impacts of deworming. Um, the treatment group, the group that had read Angris and Bishke and had kind of watched the Angris videos, um, saw that the, their, um, their, their willingness to, their, their willingness to, um, to choose the deworming program and their, their updating of beliefs about the efficacy of deworming saw large increases. Um, so let's see, I think I took some notes here. So they updated, um, right, so they updated from, from the baseline of 40% um, uh, uh, recommendation of, um, of, of saying, you know, I would, I would choose the deworming program. They updated to 80% after seeing the RCT evidence signal. Um, and they were much more willing to, to kind of rate the importance of quantitative evidence and policy making. Um, you know, they were asked, if they were asked what actions should they take before rolling out a new program, they were much more likely to say, well, I should probably conduct a randomized controlled trial, the whole series of things like this that dramatically improved. Um, and so, so both, both the World Bank and the Pakistan experiment seem to suggest that there there are things that we can do um, to engage with policymakers to um, increase the likelihood that, that rigorous science will be adopted into policy. And, and some of that is just um, training and education and including what we, what we do in our own schools, right? Um, the, and the last thing is that in-person delivery appears to help too. So there was a recent experiment, a field experiment in Brazil um, where the team worked with the, the Brazilian Conference of Mayors um, and they were allowed to go to the, the annual conference of Brazilian mayors. And um, they, ran, they had a randomized invitation to mayors to come to an information session that the research team was gonna hold um, about, um, uh, about a, a strategy to, in, to increase tax compliance. And the strategy was one that had a bunch of RCT evidence. It's essentially, you know, sending reminder letters. It's like a nudge experiment to increase compliance. So they, um, the mayors that showed up came to the information session and there was like a 45 minute presentation um, of the evidence and um, you know walking walking through it explaining it and then they and then they actually watched what the mayors did over like an 18 month follow-up period and they saw about a 30 percent um, increase in the treatment group the mayors that came that were invited to the session in terms of their adoption of the of the tax compliance letters. So there, it seems to be that's you know that's different. That that it was the mode of delivery there instead of just kind of you know giving somebody a little one word paragraph that says there was RCT evidence and then seeing how they update their beliefs immediately in a survey experiment. This was in person. It was you know forty five minute thing. It was you know somebody probably skilled at delivery. So so there maybe the takeaway is that um, you know we have we have some some shoe leather <laughs> like work to do in terms of conveying our findings to policymakers. And I'll just close with, um, you know, my own personal takeaway from this. So my own work over the last four or five years has been in criminal justice. Um, and there's been a variety of findings that have suggested that quality of life offenses and prosecutions for victimless nonviolent misdemeanor offenses are not doing any good and they're probably doing harm. So how do you get people to listen to that finding? So we contacted the major cities chiefs association, which is the 70 largest law enforcement police departments in the country. And we said, can we come to your conference and do a panel on, on our research findings? And they said, sure. So um, we were it was supposed to be in New Orleans, but Ida has, has bumped it forward. But, you know, I think maybe Maybe you know we need to to hit the road a little bit as researchers and get out there and do a little bit more to to um, you know um, deliver our findings with with um, charisma and, and entertainment value and 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 not just uh, rely on our published works. So that's what I have. Thanks. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so um, we've had a couple of questions come into the chat. So that's great. Um, Rob answered one. I flagged one that I'll bring up during the Q&A. So if you have others, drop them in the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, and now for our final presentation, Sean Grant.
Great. Thanks, Philip. Can you see the slides okay? Yep. Perfect. Well, thanks for moderating um, and thanks so much to my panelists. I'm really, really excited to be here and be part of this panel. Uh, my name is Sean Grant. I'm an assistant professor of social and behavioral sciences at the Fairbanks School of Public Health at IU. And for my portion of the panel, I wanted to provide an overview of a program of work I'm doing with several colleagues, uh, Evan Mayo Wilson at Indiana University, Lauren Supley at the William T. Grant Foundation, and Pamela Buckley at the University of Colorado Boulder. And we're looking on the ability of meta science to improve the trust and research that is used instrumentally to inform social policy and practice in the US context. So mechanisms that are actually creating infrastructure where there is a pipeline from research to policy and law. So this is under the banner of the evidence-based policy movement, which has grown significantly in the United States over the last decade. Evidence-based policy, for those unfamiliar, involves the use of rigorous research to build a credible evidence base that's then used to focus policies and resources on effective social prog programs addressing the needs of the public, uh, in this case, in the U.S. context. Uh, the stages involve reviewing evidence on the effectiveness of social programs, then incorporating that evidence into budgeting and policy decisions, ensuring that the programs that you select are being delivered effectively, and then determining whether those programs are achieving desired results, feed back into the next cycle of funding of social programs in a given context for a given social problem. And in the United States, evidence clearinghouses are the primary resource for the first step of this policymaking process of reviewing evidence on the effectiveness of social programs and incorporating this evidence into budgeting and policy decisions. So for those unfamiliar, you might be asking, what is an evidence clearinghouse? So clearinghouses are repositories of evidence that follow published standards to identify empirical studies that test the effects of programs, assess the validity and rigor of those studies, and then they disseminate information about programs they deem as evidence-based to the public, to researchers, to policymakers, to decision makers. So pictured here is the process for rating programs for Blueprints for Healthy Youth Development. That's a clearinghouse run by my colleague, Pamela Buckley. They focus on identifying evidence-based programs for youth and families. So as I mentioned, these clearinghouses evaluate research according to explicit procedures and standards of evidence. And they're doing that to try and ensure that the programs that they designate as evidence-based are truly beneficial and historically, they've done this by assessing uh, prescribed causal inference methods. So things like random assignment to minimize risks of selection bias. And to their credit, they have been a large part in the last 10 to 20 years of making this kind of rigorous science, at least in the intervention research literature, more normative amongst researchers, journals, and funders. So they support evidence-based policy by distilling findings from the most trustworthy research to assist decision makers in selecting programs for which there is rigorous rigorous causal evidence. So I think for this panel, I think a takeaway is that clearinghouses uniquely sit at this intersection of science and policy that we're interested in by supporting work to implement evidence-based programs at scale, programs that have rigorous science behind them. And in the United States, evidence clearinghouses that are specifically supported by the federal government are particularly influential because they increasingly are affecting literally billions of dollars of federal funding for social programs across social policy sectors. And recently, these are used in what are called tiered evidence, grant making, or financial models in which federal agencies award smaller amounts of funding to programs with little to no evidence and larger amounts of funding to scale up programs with strong evidence of success. As an example, in 2018, the Family First Prevention Services Act was codified in the Title IV of the Social Security Act aiming to significantly reform the federal child welfare policy in the United States. And as part of this act, the actual statutory language in the law itself, so not the administration, but actually in the law, written by Congress, signed by the president, called for the establishment of a prevention services clearinghouse that's now run by the Administration for Children and Families and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And the charge for this clearinghouse was to conduct objective and transparent reviews of research on programs that are intended to provide support to children and families and prevent foster care placements. And to give you a sense of how instrumental science is in this policy, under this act, moving forward, at least 50% of each state's expenditures are required to be on programs that this clearinghouse has given its strongest evidence rating, that is well-supported programs based on randomized trials or quasi-experiments of these programs in the literature. 
Um, so why is this relevant to this overall conference? Meta-science research has raised important concerns about the assumptions that underlie this model of evidence-based social policy. The first is concern about difficulties in replicating results from the social, behavioral, and health sciences. The promise of evidence-based policy is that we invest in programs with strong evidence of effectiveness, and this will increase the likelihood of positive outcomes for a policymaker's constituents. The time and money it takes to scale programs in a community is great, and it's equally challenging to take away programs that communities are already implementing. So reproducibility and replicability are essential to social program research, and particularly for scaling programs in the evidence-based policy model. The second concern is the prevalence of detrimental research practices that threaten the credibility and utility of evaluations of program effectiveness in the scientific literature. So these could be underspecified studies where methods, interventions, population settings, other important details are not shared in reports, which makes it difficult to appraise the quality of a study and the settings and populations to which results are applicable. A second concern is reporting bias, referring to when scientists or journals decide not to publish analyses, outcomes, or perhaps entire studies, often because results are not meeting some kind of threshold like statistical significance. Specification searching, also known in some contexts as data dredging and p-hacking, refers to repeatedly searching a data set or, or trying alternative analyses until a result is found, often a statistically significant result, and then often failing to control for or report all of the tests that were undertaken. And then lastly, really understandable human error, like technical errors that may exist in computational reproducibility, computational analyses, or perhaps copy and paste errors from Excel or your statistical software into Word. And then the third concern that I imagine has been highlighted quite a bit over the last two weeks has been the perverse structural incentives in the ecosystem supplying and identifying evidence-based programs. So just highlighting a few actors in our evidence ecosystem, sponsors make decisions on which research is conducted and how that research is conducted, which directly feeds into our available evidence base. And this includes whether projects include representative samples and whether funding for replications, for example, is available. Journals are more likely on average to publish papers with exciting and innovative findings over replications or null or negative findings. So scholars have reported anticipating a lack of interest in publishing papers with null findings, leading to more reporting biases, leading to the file drawer problem. And then research institutions foster this publish or perish funding or, failing, funding or famine ecosystem through tenure and promotion policies and broader discipline specific incentive and reward structures. And then that supports and feeds back to behaviors of sponsors, behaviors of publishers, an ecosystem that creates these perverse incentives leading to detrimental research practices. But then to be positive, meta-science, and in particular for us, open science, serves as a motivation as it provides opportunities to align scientific practice with scientific ideals, accelerating discovery, and broadening access to scientific knowledge. So for example, transparency and openness could provide mechanisms for third parties like clearinghouses to check for research practices that threaten the validity and reproducibility of research, and open science focuses on making research products and outputs more usable and freely available to everyone, which could then be read or downloaded freely by stakeholders not affiliated with research institutions that have journal subscriptions like policymakers and evidence clearinghouses. So through this focus on free availability and trust in research findings and products, open science could accelerate the flow of scientific evidence into policy and law. So the motivating question for our program of research is how to align meta-science with the evidence-based policy movement. And our program of work is focused specifically to date on evidence clearinghouses in the US and the journals that have published studies on program evaluations that those clearinghouses have reviewed. Our initiative, which we've called Trust or Transparency of the Research, underpinning these social intervention tiers of evidence, follows a structure process outcome conceptual framework for evaluating the extent to which institutions in the scientific ecosystem promote transparent and open research. So we use a four P's kind of mnemonic for our framework, starting with principles of open science, which for us are the standards from the top guidelines and the literature on applicable clinical trials for FDA approval, policies of organizations like clearinghouse handbooks to codify their standards of evidence or journals instructions to author pages, procedures of organizations like the methods and tools clearinghouses use to evaluate studies 
or the manuscript submission systems that journals use as part of their journal publishing processes, and then the practices of organizations. So the information that clearinghouses report on their websites or the article templates used by journals to provide details, for example, on the use of open science practices. So our first study applied this conceptual framework to 10 clearinghouses that are sponsored by the federal US Departments of Education, Health and Human Services, Justice and Labor. As I mentioned before, these ratings are highly consequential because they are used to inform policy decisions through the kinds of tiered evidence grant making and financing models that I reviewed earlier. To evaluate the degree to which these clearinghouses support open sciences, open science practices, we downloaded their handbooks, other documents, we explored structured fields of intervention entries on their websites, and we did this work collaboratively with clearinghouse staff to share any relevant information we weren't able to identify in our review. And overall, we did find that 70%, at least seven of these 10 clearinghouses, do consider at least one open science practice. And of the practices that they consider, replication is the only one that actually influences whether an intervention is rated as evidence-based. Aside from replication, clearinghouses do address other practices like public availability of results, study registration, protocol sharing, but none of these actually are required for an intervention to be designated as evidence-based. It's just information that the clearinghouse reports out. And then on top of that, clearinghouses do not synthesize the cumulative body of evidence on programs formally using statistical meta-analyses, but rather do vote counting. They count the number of studies with a p-value that's less than 0.05 for a given outcome. And if that happens twice, great, you've hit our highest tier of evidence. So one thing we, we recommend in the paper that there's a QR code for there at the bottom is for clearinghouses to consider ways in which their current standards of evidence could actually encourage detrimental research practices like multiple hypothesis testing and selective non-reporting of studies and results to get on these lists that are tied to funding and prestige. Our second study applied this framework to the 341 journals that have published at least one study that a federal clearinghouse has used to designate a program as evidence-based. We searched their instructions for authors, fields in their manuscript submission systems, and article templates they use to disclose open science practices. We then quantified their use of open science practices using the top factor, which is a metric from the Center for Open Science that assesses the presence and stringency of any open science policies. And in short, the most common score was zero. That is, the most common score was a journal has no policies at all in open science practices. And the majority of, of journals in our data set had a score of zero or one. So either no policies or a single policy for a single practice that didn't require the use of the open science practice, but rather just required authors to disclose whether or not they use that practice. And then lastly, my colleague, Pamela Buckley, who runs the uh, Blueprints Clearinghouse, looked at the use of open science practices in actual program evaluations. So using their data from the Blueprints Registry, they examined transparency practices in 88 evaluations of social programs that focus on the prevention of negative health and social outcomes for youth and families. They found that few reports had data, code, or research materials publicly available. While 40% had protocols that were registered, only 8% were registered prospectively with a quarter being registered before conducting analyses. And about one third included details in a registered protocol describing the treatment contrast and planned inclusions, but less than 5% had a registered statistical analysis plan, like planned analytical methods or pre-specified covariates for the test of the effectiveness of programs. So we see the above as an epidemiological, meta-epidemiological baseline of where clearinghouses, journals, and researchers stood as of the end of 2020. And we started providing our findings as feedback to clearinghouses and other stakeholders in the federal context, who really do, again, deserve a great amount of credit for pushing the methodological rigor of inter -research, intervention research forward over the last 10 to 20 years. So we think that there's a chance that that could be the next 10 years or so of pushing things like open science forward. So in addition to our findings, we've shared a draft top guidelines for clearinghouses, which at least one clearinghouse, the one on home visiting for youth and families, has used to articulate standards for program evaluators on open science practices. But an important thing that we've gotten back from clearinghouses is that, uh, kind of to Rob's point about the trade-off between rigor and responsiveness, they need these practices to become more common in the literature that they review before they can make them requirements for evidence-based programs. So we started uh, designing and providing outreach to journals and program evaluators about the importance of open science practices for the research they publish,
and conduct that informs policy and practice decision making. So for the discussion, I would love to hear your thoughts on how we can align the open science movement and evidence-based policy. And then also, if you're interested in this intersection, please do get in touch. So really appreciate your time and I look forward to uh, the discussion section. Thanks so much. Wow, that's great. Okay, thank you, Sean. <clears throat> Very good. Um, let me give um, the panelists, uh, we have uh, 20 minutes left. Let me give the panelists um, uh, a couple of minutes to ask each other any questions that have come up uh, for them before we turn to the public chat. Anybody? Rob? Oh, and then Kathy. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question for Kathy. Um, so you made an interesting point about different causal identification strategies, which is a very common problem in the literature. Um, and I'd never really thought about it before, but how do you pool data? Uh, when when the different strategies are used. And I'm just wondering whether in principle it would be possible to pool the data before running it through the inferential stat, uh, strategy. So you've got a sort of meta-analytic covariance matrix uh, that hasn't been run through any particular model, and then you could apply different models. Um, and not every model could be applied to the full data set, um, but, you know, it, I, I haven't thought this through, but it, does, it, would that at all be feasible or is that just not um, possible? Yeah, I think I think it would. It's a really interesting point. And I, um, the, you know, the only thing that's required is is to be able to get the data from the researchers, um, which is which is very difficult, as you were mentioning during your talk. Um, so that's that's the main limitation. I think that we're you know we're we're less willing to share our, our data um, with each other. But if there if somehow we could have a some kind of a norm about sharing. Um, I think that would be that would be possible. So you could build you could build the largest data set that's available, and then and then run the best using best practices. Thanks. Can I can I can I quickly hop on that? I just just to say, Kathy, I don't know if you saw Rachel Meager um, had a posted a paper a few days ago um, with a with a with a co-author about using RCT and observational, kind of the problem of meta-analysis when like they have very different designs and using um, RCT and observational studies to de-bias each other. So um, where the problem with the RCTs might be that they were, you know, they were, <laughs> they have unreasonably large effect sizes because they were chosen to be conducted in places where the researchers thought they would find a large effect size. You know, and the observational studies have, but they can, they actually, they, they, um, they kind of simultaneously try to adjust for the differences um, across the two different types. Kathy, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'll look, I'll look up that study. Um, I just wanted to respond to uh, Anna's really interesting point about we like, we need to go on the road more often. And I, I really, I think that's true. So just one point is that George Mason has these training programs and they invite federal judges and I participated in those. And, um, and so they, they really like coming to those. I think we should do more of them. And I, I spoke to a couple of judges after the last one I did and they asked me to please send them potential clerks who were trained in, in empirical methods. Um, so it seems like they have a desire to wanna to get better at this, but um, you know, they're, not, they're not so sure whether whether they can do it themselves. So they're looking kind of for help. So I think we have a lot of work to do there. One other thing is that um, the American Law and Economic Review is uh, is um, getting adding a new editor position um, to attract and publish translational pieces. Um, so that's another thing we can do as lawyers that are trained both in law and in, in some kind of you know economics or psych psychology, whatever, to help translate the research for policymakers. Um, so I think there's a lot of room for that work as well. That's, um, thank you, Kathy. That's actually interesting and relates to a question that was posed by Patrick Forsher, which I'll ask and also elaborate on. Um, the translational role is an interesting one, especially for those of us interested in open science. And if open science, one of the benefits of open science, I think practices are that they, um, I don't want to say they, they're 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 uh, um, they're not reluctant to um, embrace the uh, uncertainties in science, and of course in courts especially, but also in advocacy, various policy advocacy work. Uh, 
um, uncertainty is not a virtue. Um, so you have you have advocates like like Rob says, lawyers, but but also um, policy advocates and so on for whom uncertainty is a problem. And if scientists have done things like pre-registered studies that didn't work out, like posted drafts of papers, which are still available, like had their comments um, uh, subjected to public comment, um, where there maybe are experts in the field making negative comments um, about their studies, anything, if you've ever been an expert witness, and I have not, I'm led to believe that anything like that can suddenly come up um, in the courtroom. And I wonder if there's a role, if there's a scientist role um, for the translational person who is um, slightly more certain than the practicing scientist um, who embraces uncertainty. And is that wrong for a scientist to do? In other words, if I do a meta-analysis or I've analyzed policy and I come into the, um, I come in, can I come into a courtroom and say, I'm sure of this, even though in my own research or in the research where I'm um, engaged in discovering new knowledge, I am not so sure. So I guess that might be a question for Anna, but um, but uh, but or, or Rob, whoever wants to take that, or anybody else. Uh, Anna, you want to take the first shot? <clears throat> well, I, I don't know. I think I think um, I think there's there's some low hanging fruit, and I, I feel like sometimes we um, we we are so we're almost. I don't want to say too careful because that's not what I mean, but I but I think we are um, we're kind of up here with with thinking about how our, our rules of inference and like down here are, are like all the states adopting you know like Kathy's observational studies where we're not even talking about like file drawer problems or anything. We're just talking about really really crappy studies um, <clears throat> from which nobody should be drawing any inferences. And so I feel like. Um, uh, if there's a way to, and you know, an expert, you know, so my 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 knowledge of the of the expert witness gig is that particularly in in you know in corporate litigation, the firms who are supplying expert witness testimony um, are are um, these are these are all they're all pretty high quality um, uh, experts who are producing evidence and, and kind of in like going against each other and that. That to me is um, less of a problem than the fact that like this whole world of policymaking is being driven by, um, you know, uh, not any kind of science at all. And so I guess, um, and, and to Kathy's point about the George Mason program, it's actually an evaluation of that. I don't know if you've seen that, Kathy. Um, uh, uh, this is another Daniel Chen paper. He foiled all of the um, names of the judges who attended it um, over the years, and 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 given and there was um, I think he has like invitations and then people who actually came. So he has a way to identify the effect, and it had a large effect on on their decisions. So I think kind of just introducing some basic science principles into um, policy making and judicial decision making um, would would be a positive thing. Yeah. I'll, I'll add a couple of points. Um, so I've actually uh, published three papers uh, and I don't know, six or seven experiments where we vary um, uh, advisors or experts or witnesses uh, confidence levels. And uh, while it's true that um, there's a huge market for confidence and people want experts to be confident, um, it can really backfire. So in our studies, the overconfident witness who then makes a mistake, even a small mistake, their credibility is hurt much more by that mistake than the less confidence, confident witness. And what we argue is what we should look for in our experts and what we should fight for is calibrated experts. And by calibration, I mean that you can trust their confidence level. And that actually liberates policymakers because if I, if I tell you this is something boy, we really don't know yet. And I'm only 25% confident of this or 30% confident. I'm basically telling a policymaker, um, there's, no, there's no scientific ground for you to make one decision. Or other. You're gonna have to make your decision based on other criteria. And policymakers love that. They would love to be liberated from the science. And then when we say, in this case, I'm really, you know, I'm 90% confident. You're basically saying, now is when you should listen to me. Um, uh, because I actually have something to offer. And um, the only way we can make that work is um, 
to kind of find ways to punish experts for not being calibrated, to weed out experts who are not calibrated, who, whose confidence statements don't match their knowledge. That's great. Um, Sean has a reply, then I have a follow-up, I think, which might be for Sean, but go ahead. No, I think this is really interesting. And I, I, maybe two things to throw out for folks who are specifically working in this judicial context on language on the severity of a test that you use to calibrate certainty using kind of Deborah Mayo's statistical testing and severity framework. Um, in the medical sciences for developing clinical practice guidelines, there's this approach called GRADE, where they rate the evidence underpinning the effectiveness of intervention across the quality of the studies, how consistent their findings are, how direct the evidence is to the context of inference, publication bias and precision. And then they use that to say they have high, moderate, low, or very low confidence. And it's kind of similar to uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, uh, preponderance of the evidence, and then the middle, apologies, I forget what's in the middle there. Someone can correct me. Very yeah. convincing, thank you. So if it's uh, no risks across those, there's no reasonable doubt. Studies are good, they're consistent, et cetera, but you might go down to moderate, clear and convincing, but you're not sure if there's some risk of bias. So perhaps there's something to learn from that system in the legal context. And then another uh, group that I work with is the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I've done work with them on the methods that they use to elicit experts' views on the thresholds for their burning embers diagrams. And they similarly have a process where they ask folks to rate what those cutoffs are and their confidence in them based on a replicable protocol for how to calibrate those percentages and likelihood. So it might be interesting if anyone's working in this space and expert witnesses in the legal context to see if those concrete examples can be adapted and translated into that context. Good question. Um, Emma Rinciana has a question. Um, are there any, is there any research or reports on um, evident when evidence based um, for evidence based work when the um, research is overturned. I noticed um, I have the Zotero um, uh, bibliography tool and I uh, noticed I get a pop up when a study in my database is retracted, um, hmm. which is great. Um, but um, but uh, if you have uh, if you've uh, you know I don't know how um, I'm I don't know how to do meta analysis myself. But if you've done something like assemble a database of, of, of evidence and you've issued ratings and so on, um, uh, what happens? Um, is, there, is there any policy of, is there a practice of debriefing or, um, or um, maybe Sean can speak to that in terms of the sort of the practices around this kind of question? That's a great question. Um, and it's, I think it inspires some work going forward. So I'll get in touch. But um, to my knowledge, I can't think of anything explicitly in place your best bet is probably Cochrane, which is the world leader in the medical and health literature on doing systematic reviews that are quite influential at the international and national levels. They're working uh, really heavily methodologists there on systems for automatically searching the literature for eligible studies and then trying to automate at least like title match check screening. So as part of that, I think there are some conversations, if not pilot tests on incorporating things like Zotero to signal retractions to then take those out of living systematic reviews or living evidence reviews that aren't static PDFs, but are continuously updated when something triggers an update. But I think it's also a really interesting question for the high stakes almost. Uh, the clearinghouses are kind of like formularies for the FDA where they're giving you approved practices to say, hey, let's link the studies that are justifying something being designated as an evidence-based program and if Zotero triggers that, let's take it off the list so that prospectively this isn't being used to justify use of public resources. So nothing to date, but I love the idea to explore that. So I will get in touch and credit where credit is due. It's interesting, you know, retraction is, is an extreme case, but there's really a continuum of evolving knowledge on something. And so if, if the science, you know, if the science evolves on something, what is the... Um, you know, uh, that's part of the uncertainty question is, well, we used to be pretty sure about this, but lately we've had some, you know, some new programs come along. Kathy, it looked like you were possibly getting ready to say something about that. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I saw a recent talk by Samin um, uh, ba Vasquez, I think her name is, and she, she, uh, yeah, I think. <laughs> thank you. She, um, she talked about, um, you know, she's trying to get post-publication review going. Um, we're really talking about how to get a systematic post-publication review where experts, you know, somehow experts are qualified and, um, you know, they have their own reputations, kind of like 
I don't know, like Amazon reviews, but better, you know, um, where we're actually doing some some continual post publication review and comment and that sort of thing. And, you know, I mean, that's a I don't know. Is that a pipe dream? I'm not sure. It would be I think it'd be fantastic if we could figure out how to do it. Something and I it made me think of Wikipedia, you know, um, which is not perfect, but they have like this community that um, and they try to do kind of systematic um, uh, review of, of information that's posted and pull out what's not good and keeping what's good. Um, so there are some models out there for that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Jason um, uh, speaks, Jason Chin speaks up in the q and I agree in civil uh, cases, experts might do a pretty good job of uncovering flaws and errors in each other's work and the research behind each other's work. The problem is in criminal cases, there's really only one expert and it's the prosecution's witness. I'm not sure how to deal with that. Maybe pre-registration or blinding the data um, would work as um, Rob suggested. Someone else, Rob, asked about the, um, uh, the blinded, the blinded um, uh, situation. Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, first, the, the point about uh, criminal versus civil is, is a good one. And um, Harkening back to my table on why adversarial system might not be a good analogy uh, to science, um, adversarial system does work best when both sides are are equally represented. To the, you know, truth is supposed to will out. You know, it's supposed to emerge from the the combat, and if if the, it's unequal combat, that's not going to happen. Um, I did want to say on the thing we were just talking about, a good case study would be um, 18 months of Anthony Fauci statements, um, because you could really watch in real time him trying to adapt to changing evidence. And you can also see how the public responded to him changing his mind. And a lot of people don't like it when experts change their mind. And so it's a, it's a challenge. Okay, great. We have a few minutes left. Um, one, I want to just toss it back to um, to each of you for any concluding remarks, and I'll I'll just go. Um, well, so we just had Rob, so I'll come back around to Rob, and we'll start with um, Kathy, then Anna, then Sean, then Rob for one to two minutes each. If you have anything, Kathy. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I remain optimistic, especially after this panel. Um, yeah, I think we have a lot of work to do, um, but. Hopefully, through conversations like this, we can um, coalesce around a, a few, a handful of ways forward, um, and make progress about how to how to translate the work we're doing and supply good evidence and get the policymakers to actually use it. Very good. Uh, uh, thank you, Anna. Yeah, this has been super interesting. I and mean, one of one of the one of the things I immediately wanted to know, listening to my fellow panelists, is um, you know, do we have any? I mean, you know, Sean is pretty optimistic about the role that the clearinghouses play, and I'd be really curious to know whether we have any good evidence about um, their impact, right, on on outcomes, and maybe we can, you know, if there's some kind of study we can design to see whether um, there's there's an impact on choices. I am. Um, I'm probably a little less optimistic <laughs> about their um, content and their presence, but I, you know, I would, I, it's an open empirical question. I'd love to know the answer. Good timing. Uh, Sean. Yeah, great TF. I, I think it is an open empirical question and um, shout out to my colleague, Lauren Suplee, who's a senior program officer at the William T. Grant Foundation, where they have an entire portfolio on use of research evidence. Um, so I have a pilot grant now looking at a model at the state level in Indiana and working with folks at the county level who have used their list of approved programs to propose programs for funding and seeing whether that use fits the assumptions of this model. Thinking about Carol Weiss's framework for use of research evidence, is it symbolic use? They've already decided now they're using this to justify a decision, or is it truly instrumental and in line with this? And what are barriers and facilitators that uh, could lead to guidance or other types of supports for grantees, applicants to try and meet this model. And then I think there is this open question on even if they do that, do we see changes over time and population rates of the outcomes that these initiatives are trying to target pre and post launch of them using something like comparative interrupted time series. So I think uh, there, are, there are places out there that are increasingly interested in funding work like that. And one other colleague to highlight is Catherine Oliver at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She's really a forefront thought leader on use of research evidence and is trying to build a community of researchers across substantive disciplines 
interested in this overall topic. So I, I highly recommend checking out her work and this kind of community she's trying to build that I think is very aligned with the meta-science community that attends these conferences. So you want evidence that evidence is affecting policy and evidence that policy is affecting the world? That seems like a pretty steep hill to climb. But <laughs> thank you. Okay, final words, Rob. Okay, I'll be quick. I mean, one thing I'd, I'd just really like to emphasize, and this is something that increasingly I've come to believe, is so improving the quality of our science improves our accuracy, our validity, and our calibration. Um, but there is a division of labor, and it's probably not our role to say, should policy be made on the basis of the existing evidence base? Um, policymakers have to make decisions, and they take into account a lot other than the empirical research. Uh, political feasibility, cost, and things like that. And I do think we kind of overreach when we start telling them um, that we should adjudicate when it's finally time to make policy. I don't think that's our role. So. Okay, great. Um, well, this has been fabulous. This has also been recorded, so I think we get to watch it later for um, uh, uh, for things that you missed. I'm sorry, we didn't get to quite get to everything, but we got in a lot of good questions, and I really appreciate the uh, cooperation with the time and uh, collegiality on the panel um, and the participation uh, of the audience. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, thanks for the organizers um, for bringing us together and inviting me to do it. Um, so I, I, I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Nice thank meeting you. So, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion and thank you everyone for joining us today. We appreciate it. Um, we will be closing out the webinar um, currently and then relaunching it in 30 minutes, um, just to make everyone aware, but the discussion will continue in Remo and on Slack, so um, please join us there. Um, and back in 30 minutes. I should thank Jason by name for putting this together. Thank you. Anyway, thank yes. you. Thank you all. Thank you.